Here we go. Okay, everybody got a handout? We're going to start on week number three of, of the life of Jesus. Let me pray for us as we get going. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this day, and thank you for the opportunity to look in your word again. And Father, I pray that as we, as we look at it, that we don't just see events and, and chronology and uh, tidbits of information. Father, I pray that we see your Son in the text. And I think too many times it's easy to study and not really see Jesus. You just see what Jesus did. And so we pray that, that we just be able to see him in tonight. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to get on the third week, of, or third week, the third year of Jesus' ministry. And remember, he's basically been going back and forth from north to south, to north to south, going back and forth from back down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And just to start off, we don't have to get a mic or anything like that off, but, but just uh, as we start off, what, has, what have you noticed about going through this last couple weeks? What have you noticed about... Jesus' life, or just anything, what has jumped out at you, what has struck you as interesting, or what's something that you learned that you didn't realize maybe was there? He traveled a lot. He did travel a lot. You know, that, that's true. And he actually traveled more than he needed to, because every time they went around, except once, you know, they always went around Samaria, which always added probably a day's journey to everything. But yeah, that's a good point. Did a lot of walking. Like, everyone did. Very relational, absolutely. Uh, we were sitting in a we're sitting in a training meeting today for um, a class that we're going to start teaching, and one of the things this comment that was said was you cannot separate the message of Jesus from the method that he delivered it. In the sense that Jesus was always delivered his message in a relational environment. That everything Jesus did was relational. That he did he didn't teach even. Even the people that he had conflict with, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it was still a relational environment in that it, it, he didn't just say words out to the open space. I think that's one of the things that is very different about our society today, that you can, you can say stuff without the direct audience right in front of you. You can do things. And it actually makes people a lot more bold than they would if the person was right in front of them. But... You know, even the harsh words that Jesus says is still in that relational environment. Even when he when he has to, to correct his disciples, he, which he does a lot, and he still has that relational environment. That's very true. So, what else? It just seems like he traveled through every town, every city, every place for a couple days. that he set his face toward Jerusalem in the sense that 
he was determined that he was going in this direction. Now, when he went on that, that took a long time to get there. But in other words, his goal was to get to Jerusalem, and that was for the crucifixion. And sort of like, you know, he was going there, but he didn't go directly there. He went kind of zigzag, but he was always going toward there. And I, I get the impression that, you know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I get the idea that Jesus didn't do anything on accident. <coughs> Or maybe, maybe the better word is by random. That everything he did was purposeful. And every place, I think, that he went was purposeful. And he went there for a reason. And sometimes it may have involved a big crowd. Sometimes I think he did things that he knew he was going to encounter one person. Or sometimes in the process of encountering a large group, he met this one person. And that's really what he went there to do. But yeah, just the logistics of this. Now, the other thing to remember is that Jesus wasn't the only person who did this. This were, There was a, uh, many, many rabbis that, that went around and, and did this. So it wasn't like Jesus invented this lifestyle. Uh, there were a lot of them that did that. But he obviously had a lot of people. And not only people that supported him, he also had people that didn't like him following him around as well. And, you know, I don't know what they did when the Pharisees showed up, that they just, like, sort of commandeered somebody's house or... They stayed in a little inn or something like that. They just don't know. So, yeah, I can. changed is, yeah, you know, Jesus is an incredibly polarizing figure. In Jesus' words, you're either for me or against me. You know, he says that in Revelation. Either be hot or be cold. There's, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I think what has changed in our society is that we've added a neutral in the sense that in our minds we've added a neutral. You, you can be for Jesus, you can be against him, but there's also, you can be neutral and you can go, you know, he's okay. And I think what the neutral group wants to do is, is cherry pick what they like about Jesus and ignore what they don't like about Jesus. Yeah, he taught good things. You should forgive people. He taught some good things, but there are a lot of things in there that I don't like that he talked about. And so, therefore, I'm going to choose those things that I like, and, and I'm going to be neutral on him as the Son of God. Now, that's the one thing that we're going to talk about um, today a little bit is the idea that there, there really is no middle ground. Uh, Jesus says that it, it's one or the other. And I think we've fooled ourselves as a society into thinking that you can't have a middle ground. That if I'm not anti, then I can be neutral. But the reality is, Jesus, there's, there's still just one or the other. There, there's, no, there's no in between, even though we think there probably is today. So, all right, well, let's get in and look at this. Those are good observations, good questions. So we start off, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to primarily be in Matthew and John tonight as we go through this. Now, remember Jesus has been going around. He's going down to Jerusalem. And one of the things that we're going to see now is that as Jesus moves into his third year of ministry is, you know, the first year you could probably characterize by people are getting to know him. The second year is probably characterized by the fact that that Jesus draws interest from both sides. He draws interest from people who want him to become a, an earthly king, but he also draws interest from people who want to see him <laughs> go away uh, because he's threatening them. And now what we're going to see is that Jesus is going to, to really start revealing much more about his mission, about who he is, and that that revelation that he gives to those people actually has a negative effect in a lot of times. That Jesus is going to say, this is who I am. And in particular, one time we're going to see that people have a lot of problem with that. So that's what we kind of characterize this third year, is that it really is Jesus is revealing more about himself. And in the process of doing that, he's making people choose. You're either with me or you're against me. You're so with me or you're scattered. There, there's no in between. So let's start off reading uh, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 14. So Jesus is going to feed the 5,000. 
It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Now just imagine that. That Jesus is trying to get away, and the people just, they follow him. That the news spreads. They didn't even have Facebook. And, you know, they know exactly where he's at. It says, But when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, it was evening, and the disciples came to him, and they said, This is a desolate place, and the day is over, and the crowd uh, send the crowds away and go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said to them, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve basket full, twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides the women and children. All right. So one of the things that we see here is that I, one of the reasons I love this particular um, episode and what Jesus does is that this is the the ultimate object lesson for his disciples. Remember that he had called his first disciples from, uh, from a life of fishing. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now that's, that's the, the industry of the area. He's, he's around the Sea of Galilee. And so he has these large crowds and of course the disciples are good administrators and they say, hey listen, we've got a problem. And here's the problem. And they go to Jesus with the problem and say, here's the problem. And Jesus, you have to fix the problem. And here's what we're recommending. Just send these people away. Now, Jesus says, no, I'm, I want you to figure this out. Well, of course, they can't figure this out. They're like, how are we going to feed 5,000 people? And you know the rest of it. Jesus says, well, let's do this. Now, the thing I like about this miracle is the important thing about this miracle is not that Jesus fed, fed these people. That's a miracle, no doubt. But I don't think that was what Jesus was trying to get across to these people. I think that what Jesus was doing was the ultimate object lesson. You have to remember, what, had he, what did he told his disciples? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, what does he do? He takes fish, and he feeds these people. That's what literal fishermen did. That's what physical fishermen did. You catch fish, and you feed the people. But what Jesus, said, I think, is really trying to show these people is to say... Listen, what you're going to be about, I want to show you physically what you're going to be doing with spiritual food. I want to show you with physical food how I'm going to call you to do it with, with spiritual food. Now, if you substitute those two things, you think, what was Jesus teaching these guys? What was he teaching them? He was teaching them that, number one, you don't have the food yourself. You're going to have to get it from me. That this, this spiritual food that you're going to have to feed people has to come through me. And that you're going to have to, to rely on this. You're going to have to rely on me to provide this for you. And the reality is that there's going to be an abundance. That you don't have to worry about where this is going to come from. So you can imagine that they learn this lesson in you know, a physical parable. But they look and they go, oh... So this has more to do with than just feeding people. This is not about feeding lunch to people. This is about feeding people God's word. This is about feeding people the, the bread of life that he's going to talk about in just a little bit as well. So they see this, and Jesus miraculously provides the meal. And um, their conclusion, when you get to the end of this, is that these people think, well, man, Jesus is a prophet. He's this, as it says in a couple of the other Gospels, Hey, this guy is, he's the, the ultimate sugar daddy, right? I mean, if we just keep following him, we get free lunch. We get all of these things. So, now, as soon as he does this, let's pick up in the next section here. So, he feeds all these people. Look in chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now, he's at the Sea of Galilee. He's actually probably on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. So, he's going to go to the other side. Which means that he's going to, he tells the disciples, I want you to get in the boat, and I want you to go to the other side. Now, remember, what did these guys do for a living? Fishermen. They were out on boats all the time. Right? They knew how to handle boats. So he sends them out, and to go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. 
When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch, which was in the middle of the night, um, fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, do not be afraid. It is I. And we'll go down through the next. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, oh, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when he had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought him all who were sick, and implored him that they might not only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. So now Jesus walks on the water. He's fed 5,000. And we see an important lesson here in the life of Jesus is that he has to, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. He has this unlimited connection with the Father, this spiritual connection. But the physical part of him has to recharge his batteries. And so what does Jesus do? He sends the, the disciples away. He says, you go to the other side of the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, which is really like a big lake. And... I'll catch up to you. So he goes off by himself to pray. He goes off by himself um, to, to recharge his spiritual batteries. And, you know, the lesson I always get from that is if Jesus had to take time out, we probably do too. You know, are we, are we more spiritual than Jesus? Uh, do we have an unlimited supply of spiritual power? Even Jesus had to get away from people and say, you know what, I need to, I need to recharge my spiritual batteries. I think it's a good lesson for us. So, now... The crowds keep forcing him. They're going to keep going. And Jesus um, comes to his disciples in the middle of a storm. Now, the one thing that we probably don't realize when reading this passage is that the Jews were not a, as I say, a seafaring people. And they had major reservations about the sea. And in fact, there was Jewish traditions that out of the sea came chaos. So that's significant that when you see Jesus on the water that the Jews thought that that's where you had sea monsters. I mean, if you think about it, you send people off to the sea that never come back. Where do they go to? Obviously, they're eaten by monsters, right? Uh, things like that. That the sea was responsible for taking a lot of people. So they didn't, they didn't send people to the other side of the world. They fished on the Sea of Galilee. That was about it. And even then, these storms would roll up. So the fact that Jesus is out in the midst of this storm, walking on the water... That in and of itself would be enough to just go, whoa. You know, that they, they recognize. Now, it's interesting. What do they think Jesus was? They think he's a ghost. Why? Because they believe that out in the sea are these storms. This is the sort of the, um, the abode of demons. This is where chaos is. They didn't think that maybe even God had much to do with the, the sea. And so... They're scared to death. They're out on the ocean, even though they know how to handle themselves. And they see Jesus walking. They think he's a ghost, but he calls Peter out. And they think about that again. What's the lesson he's teaching Peter? Is that, hey, even in the midst of anything, if I call you out, it's going to be okay. That when I call, I always think about that. When Jesus calls you to step out of the boat, the waves don't stop. They don't stop at all. The waves keep going. That Peter walks to him in the midst of the storm. And of course, you've heard sermon after sermon after sermon on it. As soon as Jesus takes his eyes off Jesus, he begins to sink. And you know the spiritual implications of that. And it's the same that is true. Now, what I think is interesting is that as soon as Jesus gets in the boat, the storm stops. As soon as he gets in, the storm just completely stops. What do you think the significant significance of that is? Why do you think it stopped as soon as he got in? Now, I think it's interesting in another place we see that, that he's in the boat, remember, and he's sleeping during the storm, and they're scared to death. So one time Jesus is in the boat and it's storming, but another time he gets in and as soon as he gets in it stops. Could be, say, remember, I don't, I don't know 
See, now I'm not playing guess my mind. I'm just curious what you guys think. Based on what's going on, why else do you think it would have would have stopped? Teddy.
After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I think that is one of the most interesting verses in all of John. I think it's one of the most telling verses. We'll come back to it in a second. It says, So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not... Um, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So, Jesus gives this bread of life discourse, and he continues to explain, he uses the example of Moses and manna in the wilderness to explain that he's really the spiritual, the spiritual component that these people need in their lives, that you need what he has to offer. Now, after many of the disciples hear this, we read in verse 66 again. It says, After hearing this, many of his disciples turned away and didn't follow him. And I think that that is so typical of one of the responses to Jesus that we see. I mean, it's, in fact, it's much like the parable of the sower. Remember the parable of the sower? You've got these responses. You've got the seed that falls on the hard ground. It doesn't grow at all. You've got the seed that falls in the shallow ground that springs up, and then once the heat comes on it, it withers away because it doesn't have any root. You have the seed that falls among the thorny ground, that it grows, but the thorns, as it says, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out. You've got the good. Now, I think what you see here is an example of what Jesus would taught by a parable, by a parable you actually see. Because what you've got is you've got people that have followed him, they spring up. But when he really starts making demands of their life, when he starts giving expectations of what it means to follow him, people turn away and say, no thanks. No thanks. And I think that is such a typical response that we see in the churches today, at least in our culture, probably not in so many other cultures. But in our culture, what you have is you've got people that say, as long as I only have to go this deep, I'm good. As long as Jesus doesn't try to change me, I'm good. As long as Jesus doesn't make any demands of that I change my lifestyle. As long as I don't have to do X or Y or Z, I'm good. But as soon as it becomes clear that Jesus expects more of me, then I'm done with that. And I think that's that just such, you know, the response to Jesus hasn't changed since the time of John at all. So, and then of course he asked the twelve, and you know, he asked that, and they go, you're going to leave too? And I love their response as well. Now, you know, Peter always gets sort of, you know, a bad rap for saying dumb stuff. But Peter says a lot of good stuff too. And this one he says, where are we going to go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. We've come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. So I love that Peter says that right there. Um, and so they acknowledge that. Now, all right, let's, uh, let's just stop there. We're going to go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 15. But any questions or comments? Right then and there. And I'll just repeat it. Adam can do it. But just as we go along, I'll repeat the question. No. I think one of the things that we always fail to do whenever we read the Gospels is that you always have to look at what happens before or what happens afterwards. Because so much of of the significance of each story is tied up. Where did they just come from? Where did they go? Where are they at? You know, where are they physically at? And then we're going to see this as significant here in just a little bit. All right, so Matthew 15. We'll go back to Matthew 15, uh, verse 1. Now we see that Jesus is going to have a discussion with some of the guys that come up from Jerusalem. These are the teachers of the law. It says, When the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break... Now, this is, this is important, so take this sentence apart carefully. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered, now, let's just stop and think. What did they say? You've broken the tradition of the elders. They did not say you've broken the commandments of God. You've broken the tradition of the elders. He answered and said to him, why? <laughs> so they're accusing him of breaking the tradition of the elders. Now look what he does. 
say, why are you breaking the tradition of the elders? Because your disciples don't wash their hands the right way. He says, well, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother. Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you have, um, excuse me, what would you have gained from me is given to God. He did not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made the void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of God. All right. Now I think that passage right there, again, what do we see? What's, what's typical of the third year of Jesus' ministry? Conflict. He's having conflict with the people that are following him. Now he's going to have even more conflict with his enemies. This is, this is so telling. They accuse him of breaking the tradition of the elders. Now in their mind, what did they really say? They said the tradition of the elders, but what do they equate, equate the tradition of the elders with? The command of God. And in their mind, by not washing their hands ceremonially correctly, as his disciples didn't do, that they were not washing their hands exactly as the tradition said, that in their mind, they were breaking the commandment of God because they equated the tradition of the elders with the command of God. And so they're going to they're gonna get him on this. And I love what Jesus says back. He says, you're accusing me of breaking the tradition. Well, you're breaking the command of God for the sake of tradition. Now, what his specific accusation here is, Apparently what was happening, he says, listen, you're supposed to take care of your mother and father. But what you guys are doing is you're saying, oh, the money that I was going to take care of you with, I've dedicated to God. That's his accusation. He said, so what has happened is you're leaving your mom and dad destitute because it makes you look good that you're giving your money to the temple. He says, now you tell me what is really honoring your mother and father is giving away what should be rightfully theirs, honoring your mother and father by making yourself look good? No. It says you honor God with your lips, but you don't do it with your heart. You don't do it with your actions. And again, that's pretty telling as we look at this. So we see his attitude toward the religious leaders is becoming more and more confrontational. Now, this brings up an interesting point. And I think this is something that, that we have to remember as the church. Who are the people that Jesus, think about this, who are the, who is the group of people that Jesus had conflict with? Who did he have zero patience for? The religious leader, the religious. Not necessarily the, the people who were devout, but the people who thought that the way to God was through keeping commandments, the legalists, the people that did not keep the law at its heart. The people that in essence, wanted to keep people away from God. Because that was what they did. They were the law police. No, you're, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. The people that Jesus always took time for were not the ones who were worried about keeping every little law. They were the people that just honestly wanted to see God. Like, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to find God. And I need that. So I think that's important to know is that so many times, um, I think the longer you are a Christian, the more you tend to grow toward the Pharisees. And I just think that is because you forget what it's like to, to never know Jesus. And you get to the point where you start saying, well, here's all these traditions. Here are all these things that I think have to be this way. And if you don't do those things, then really you're not a Christian. You know, I think we all get very close to being that person at times that we find things and we go, no, I've confused my preference with what God really says. I've confused the way I like things with this, or I've confused my particular understanding of this with what God has to say. And I think Jesus says, hey, listen, there's a core of what the gospel is. There's a core of what the command of God is. And they're not the same thing. My traditions are not the same as that. Yeah, Rick? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, he says, you know, some of that goes back to the past history. Remember we talked about the very first week. Their ancestors were the ones who voluntarily gave up their life to protect God's word. So 
they thought that, you know, number one, they were pretty proud of themselves because, hey, my ancestors gave up their life to protect God's word. And to keep people from breaking it, we're going to build the hedge around it. That was their own word. So remember, you keep walking further back from the cliff. So if we keep people 10 feet away from the cliff, then there's no way they can go over the cliff. The problem is that they equated their traditions with the actual command of God. You know, I think that I think if you had to if you have to look at what you know really probably more closely resembles the the attitude of the Pharisees today, I think there are probably a couple of things. One is you know your question was the way we've always done it. Part of it is yes, whenever you get stuck in a particular method of how you do things, you know, and you look and you go, well, this is the only way we can do this. Um, and you know, it's okay to have preferences. There's nothing wrong with that. To say, hey, this is the way I personally like things. What's wrong is when you say, I'm going to put my preferences above the mission of the church. Whatever that is. When I go, I'd rather me be comfortable than the church be effective. But there's other attitudes, not just like that. I think many times, you know, we... Um, I think we, you know, one of the one of the big things with the Pharisees is that they were incredibly judgmental. They always looked at the other person as inferior to them spiritually. They always did that. You remember the the parable that Jesus tells? You know, he says, you know, there's two people. There's the Pharisee and then there's the sinner. And the Pharisee, you know, stands before God and says, Oh God, thank you for not making me like one of those. And you have the sinner that says, God, I, I really don't have anything. And I think. I think that many times we can do that. That we see people that come to church. We see people that are that are have never been in a relationship with Jesus before, and we want to. You think about this. What did the Pharisees do? They put all these external rules on people. So if you really want to be in God's great good graces, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And so many times we do that same thing. If you really want to be who God wants you to be. Here's all these regulations that you got to start keeping. you got to do all that. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't expect people to grow into spiritual maturity. But it's amazing how many external regulations we put on people. That they have to be a certain way. You know, I mean, we can make a list a mile long of, of what those things are. You have, to, you have to have this viewpoint. You have to do this. You have to do that. All those things. And many times we have the same attitude that the Pharisees do. As Jesus says, you put an unbearable weight on people. There's no way you can keep all these things. But we realize that, no, you know, salvation is by faith, through grace, not as a result of works. The works come because you're saved, not so that you're saved. You have to remember that. Okay. Um, okay, so really Jesus engages these guys. I already said this debate is on legalism and hypocrisy and external traditionalism. You know, this, these are the same group of people that John the Baptist, remember what John the Baptist said to these guys. He said, you're, you're just all show. There, there's no substance to you. And again, I think there's such a danger in that with us too, that we can, as he says, you know, you're, you, you polish the outside, but inside you're just a tomb full of dead man's bones. You know, um, you make the outside look good, but the inside is rotten. It's full of rotting flesh. And so many times we do that same thing. They put tradition over God's commands. All right, we talked about all those things. Um, okay. Okay, we're doing all right. Um, the Syrophoenician woman, Matthew 20, 15, 22. So let's, we're going to skip a little bit of this. Go down to verse 21 of 15. It says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now this is important. He goes, if you look on your Bible, Tyre and Sidon are up, they're up north along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. This is not, so now Jesus is going to a place that was not considered Israel. He's going to the Gentiles. He's going to this place where the heathens lived, right? So this is like, hey, and this is where Queen Jezebel was from. I mean, these were the pagan of all pagans. So Jesus goes there. And behold, a Canaanite woman, not a Jew, a Canaanite woman. Now that, that, might, that phrase, a Canaanite woman, is an Old Testament phrase. 
Remember when we, uh, for those of you who uh, we preach through judges and we do all this stuff we talk about, being called a Canaanite was not a compliment. Canaanite was a synonym for idol worshiper, uh, for heathen, for pagan, right? So a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Okay, so after the confrontation with the Pharisees, Jesus goes north to Tyre and Sidon. And this was an area um, outside of his homeland. This he goes out. And in fact, he had warned, when he sends out his disciples, he had warned them, don't go to this area. This is like the bad part of town, I guess, if you want to think of that. How would they have, how would they have known him? How would she have known him that far? Well, obviously the word of mouth spread. I mean, the people on the you know, when Jesus goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that's not Israel either. So his fame spread. You know, there. I think one of the mistakes we probably think about this time is that, like, people never traveled or worked. And traveled. People traveled frequently. The Romans built extensive road systems. Um, trade went through all the time. So I'm sure that she had heard of this. I'm sure that she had had heard word of Jesus or for whatever reason. So it's not unreasonable to, to think that she had heard that at all. So um, he sees this, and she's got a demon-possessed daughter. Uh, Jesus refused at first, and he actually, man, he kind of brings out some harsh statements, it sounds like, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus is going, you know, he, first he says, listen, I'm, I'm sent to Israel. I'm not sent to you. And then she goes, no, please, please. It's, it's interesting that she even says, um, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She even throws out Jewish things for him. She's not Jewish, but she uses a Jewish term, son of David. David wasn't her king, but she even throws this out. I think she's trying to do whatever she can to grab his attention, to, to do it. She is seeing him with, she's using every trick, every bit of leverage. She has so much so that the disciples are like, you please get rid of her? I mean, she is making a scene. She is just uh, making an annoyance of herself. And so they do it, and, and Jesus says, no, listen, you know, I come to Israel, not to you. Which begs the question, what are you doing there? Now, see, that's the thing I always look at is that I don't think Jesus was I don't think Jesus was being intentionally rude or mean to this woman. I think, I, I really think that in this instance, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples something. Remember, everything he does is intentional. Why would Jesus go to the most pagan place and then say, no, I didn't come here to do anything? He's not going there to rest. He's not going there to... So it doesn't make sense that Jesus would go there and then when someone was actually wanting his help, he would turn them down. I don't think he would do that. And it's certainly out of Jesus' character to be rude to a non-Pharisee, I guess if you want to think of that. So I think Jesus is teaching his disciples a lesson again. Again, what's the lesson? This woman is pursuing the Son of God with everything she has. And how many parables did Jesus tell about that? You go out and find the, the pearl buried in the field. What do you do? You sell everything you have to get that. You have to be willing, you know, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. You have to be willing to sell everything. All these things that Jesus said repeatedly, he actually sees a woman who's willing to willing to, to say, number one, I need help. Number two, I'm going to go get help from a Jew, somebody that probably, from people that have been probably been incredibly rude to me my whole life because they didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentile. And then when the disciples are sort of going, get away from me, she keeps persisting. I mean, I mean just when, when you see this woman, you have to imagine mothers out there, how would you describe this woman's state of mind? You've got a daughter, you've got a child who is suffering so much. What what one word would you use to describe this woman's? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, every 
want in here? Desperation. This is a woman who will do literally anything to get what her daughter needs. And I think Jesus is, is uses this woman as a, as a powerful lesson to his disciples to say, this is what you have to do. This is the attitude that you have to have. Rather than the attitude of the Pharisees that say, oh, we're only going to take Jesus on our terms. We're only going to deal with whatever. This is what you've got to, you've got to be these people that, that nothing will stand in your way to get to the Son of God. So, okay, so after this, um, Jesus then visits the Decapolis, which was the ten cities. Uh, we're not going to really talk about that um, very much. But on his way back, all right, Matthew 15, look at verse 29. It says, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. Now, that doesn't, when you, when you see that, that's not like Jesus is just walking along, dipping his hand in the water. You know, that's not that. This is, that's his route. He's going along the Sea of Galilee where all of these, all of these cities were. So he's intentionally going here. Right? Um, walked along beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with him the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowds wondered. And when he, they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So Jesus does this. Once he's back on the shore of Galilee, he resumes his ministry of healing. The crowds look amazed at his power over disease. Right? And, and think about this. I think we look at Jesus healing people as that's kind of cool. And, you know, to us, where we're used to almost medical miracles, I mean, you know, I don't want to equate with that, but we're used to people being made well regularly, right? I mean, we're used to being able to take a pill or have an operation or whatever, and very much a lot of times you're well again after that. This was a, this was a day when, I mean, if you got sick, you didn't go... To Walgreens and get this, you know. You got sick, you probably end up dying of or different things like that. Or if you were crippled, you were you you were lost, all of these things. So this is this is Jesus overcoming impossible odds. This is Jesus doing amazing things. So he performs other miracles with this, and then he travels um, by boat to the region of um, the home of Mary Magdalene. Things like that. Okay. Um, Matthew 16, 2, okay, we got a lot to cover. Um, Matthew 16, 1 through 2, in fact, I'm going to give, I'm going to skip some of these because I want to get to this um, one. So Jesus reasons with his Jews and his own disciples, uh, the blind man is held in Bethsaida, back to Jerusalem. Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles. We come down to three of them at in John, number 11. I'm skipping several of so I want to talk about Matthew 16. Um, at the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, further teaching, he goes up on the Mount of Olives. Um, number 13, healing of the blind men. All right? And now I want to come to number 14, because we're actually going to spend a little bit of time on this. Is in Matthew chapter 16, this is whenever Jesus has his good confession. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. It says, Now when they had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, if you've got your Bible map, the, the, the district of Caesarea Philippi, if you find the Sea of Galilee, you go north, and a, just north of that is the, this region of Caesarea Philippi. If you find a place called Mount Hermon, it's up north of there. Right? And he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? A Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ.
Christ. Uh, this is one of the most important passages in the Gospels. All right, so here's what we have. We're going to dissect this apart. So Jesus takes his disciples far north. He takes them to this region called Caesarea Philippi. Now, um, and really he kind of takes them out of the realm of, of Israel or Judea. So since there were so many, so the first thing I can remember, he takes them to this specific location. I'm going to talk about the location here in just a little bit. He takes them to this specific location, and since there were so many opinions regarding this, Jesus kind of puts the question to these guys. Who do people say that I am? All right? Now, that's a pretty good question. It's a question that people have to answer today. So Peter answers with the great confession. Now, this is the first time that this has really sort of been formulated in this expression. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he says, you're the Christ. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew term Messiah. It means the promised one. So we say the Messiah, that's Hebrew. Christ is the Greek equivalent to that. It means the promised one, the anointed one. The one that we have been expecting all this time. And so Jesus replies and he says, Peter, you're correct. All right, you're correct on this. And then Jesus' um, not condemnation, commendation, you have to say this correctly, commendation of Peter in verses 18 and 19 have been the cons have been the source of a considerable debate. Right? So look at verses 18 and 19 again. Right? So we're good with all this. Remember, Jesus says, Who do people say that I am? They go, Well, some people think this, some people think that, it's all kind of stuff. Now, what I think is important is that Jesus then focuses the question. He says, number one, what are the possibilities? But then he says, who do you say that I am? And I think that's the important question because people have to answer it for themselves. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about Jesus. What matters in the end is who do you think that Jesus is? Who do I? That no one can answer that question for anyone else. You see, when it comes down to it, that's what the most important question is. Who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, when he says that, then Jesus, look at verses 18 and 19, he says, And I am, blessed are you, verse 17, Simon bar Jonah, flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. And then he strictly told them, good job, you got the right answer, but don't tell anybody. Right? Don't tell anybody. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Okay, so what we see here, the reason these verses are so important for a couple of reasons. One is that these are, these are a couple of the verses that the Roman Catholic Church uses to to really say that Peter was the first pope. That they look at this and they go, yeah, this shows, hey, Jesus said Peter is going to be the primary focus of the church. He's going to be the one. And so they point to these verses for really legitimacy of the papacy. That Peter is the first pope. So look at this, all right? Now, Protestants, let's say all Protestants, I can talk about myself as a Protestant who've been taught this, all right? So, well, when he says, yes, you're the rock that I'm going to build my church on. What I was taught is interesting is that the response I was taught to this swings the other way. And what I was taught was that when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The question is, what's the rock? Right? Catholic interpretation would say the rock is Peter. I'm going to build my church on Peter. I was always taught the rock is the confession. That the confession that I'm going to build my church on, that's what it is. The fact that I am the Christ, the Son, the living God. All right? Um, let me give you some things before I kind of tell you where I land on this. All right? Here's some things to think about. Um, some critical issues. All right? We're going to go into the deep end of Bible study here for just a second. All right? First of all, here's some analysis, some things to think about. Number one is that Matthew is the only gospel to record this. Right? No other Gospels record that this takes place. 
Um, Mark and Luke skip this confession and they skip right to the warning that says no to the vulture. Now, what is also important, I think, is that this is not the only this is not the only passage that Matthew singles Peter out for doing something good. Right? So one of the things that we find in the Gospel of Matthew is that we kind of routinely see that Peter is singled out as he is the leader of the disciples. That Peter is always out in front. He's out in front doing good things, like getting out of the boat and walking on the water. He's also going to be out in front doing things like denying Christ. Right? So one of the things that we see in the Gospel of Matthew is that Peter is widely regarded as the leader of the, the disciples at this point. So, um, some scholars look at verses 18 and 19, and they just sort of take their pen and mark them out of the Bible and say, well, these were latter additions to the New Testament that the Catholic Church added in just to prove the papacy. I don't think that's, that's correct at all. Right? So, here's the thing that we see in this is that even in, um, even in the, the English, we see that Jesus is obviously using a play on words with Peter and his name. Remember, when Peter first comes to, to Jesus, remember Jesus changed his name. Remember what he changed his name to? Cephas. Right. Now, Cephas was the Aramaic word for stone. Right? Now, Peter is one of the Greek forms of the word rock. Right? So Peter is rock in Greek. So when Jesus comes and says, hey, I'm going to change your name to Cephas, he's really kind of saying, I'm going to give you the same name but in a different language. Right? Now, Jesus was sort of having a play on words on this. So he obviously makes this word. And what happens here is that Peter's name was Petros. That's the masculine form of this. So Jesus says, you are Peter, Petros, and upon this rock, and he uses the word, the Greek word, Petra, which is the feminine form of the same word, right? It's in Greek, there's masculine and feminine forms, right? So you are Peter, Petros, and upon this rock, Petra, not the rock band, the old Christian rock band, for those of you who know that, that's where they get it from, right, is Upon this rock, I will build my church. So the question is, is he referring to Peter? Is he referring to the confession? Or is it something, both of them? Right? So we already know that he changed his name to, to Cephas earlier. Now, Jesus is completing the name game with Peter. I think what we see here. Now, some people make a, a big deal about the, the difference in the Greek words that I just told you. Some scholars will look at that and they'll go, well, Petros, Petros, his name was the masculine, that meant a big rock, and Petra meant a small rock, and different things like that. The problem with this is that, that Jesus probably had this conversation in Aramaic. That was the language that they spoke. And so, if Jesus were speaking this in Aramaic, he probably would have said, Peter, Cephas, and upon this, see, Aramaic it would have been the same words probably. Right, so we make this distinction about the Greek, but the conversation probably wasn't originally in Greek. Um, so, it seems, however, I think, now don't, don't pick up rocks to stone me just yet, all right? I think that it seems obvious that, that Jesus is saying something about Peter, right? You can't just look at this whole thing and say Jesus is just totally ignoring Peter. Because what has Peter done? Peter's the first guy. I mean, Jesus makes a big deal about the fact that Peter's the first one to say this. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, my Father's in heaven. So, Jesus says, good job, Peter. You did something. You're the first one to figure this out. God has revealed this to you. So, I think that it is to Peter that the rock metaphor is applied. Um, I don't necessarily think it is the confession that he was talking to. Now, let me give you some other evidence to, to show you why I think that. Let's think about this for a second. If Peter, if, if Jesus was saying to Peter, listen, you're the rock, you're the leader of these disciples, and I'm going to build my church on what you guys do. You're going to be the foundation of what we do. Let's think about this for a second. All right? Um, we know 
Let's think of this. Peter was the acknowledged leader of the apostles, right? Peter, who preached the first gospel sermon? Acts chapter 2. Peter. I mean, Peter is the one who is leading the way preaching the gospel. Who was the first person to take the gospel to the Gentiles? Acts chapter 10. Cornelius. Peter. He was that. All right? So, who's the first person to preach the gospel to the Jews? Peter. Who's the first person to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Peter. Jesus is calling out and saying, listen here, you're going to be the first one to do these things. All right? So, I think, and also Ephesians tells us, Ephesians tells us that, hey, that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles. It actually uses that phrase. All right, so I think by taking this view doesn't necessarily mean that we're acknowledging that Peter was the first pope. Actually, I don't think it says that at all. I think what Jesus is saying to them is, listen, good job, Peter. You guys are going to be the foundation on which I do everything else. Does that mean you're, you're special and you're going to be the first pope? No, I don't think that's what it's saying at all. I don't think we have to acknowledge that. I think the confession is important, absolutely. But I think in the course of Matthew's storyline, Matthew emphasizes the role of Peter. And I think Jesus is taking this. I mean, later on, we know that Peter denies him. And again, what does Jesus say? He takes special care. So Peter plays this prominent role that we see. So I think you can look at this and, and look at it and go, yeah, I think Peter did have a special role in what was going on. Does that mean Peter was perfect? No, not at all. Look in Galatians chapter 2. I mean, Galatians chapter 2, Peter had screwed up and actually had regressed and stopped eating with Gentiles. And Paul, the apostle, says, I confronted Cephas to his face. Now, I always think, wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on that wall to see two apostles do this whenever Paul has to call them out and say, listen, dude, you're wrong. That doesn't sound very Pope-like, does it? Um, at all. So I don't. I think by looking at this, you don't have to accept the fact that Peter was the first Pope. I think. I think Jesus is saying, "Listen, Peter, you are going to play a prominent role. So you better get your act together. You better. You better get this stuff going." Okay. Just a couple more things we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to look at the Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Now, the other thing I was going to say about the being in Caesarea Philippi, um, I've been where this happens uh, in Caesarea Philippi. The, the thing that's interesting is that the place where Jesus was probably at was a significant pagan temple. In fact, it is, uh, it's, the remains of it are still there. If you go to my office, you can see, uh, you can see a picture of it on the wall that I took. It is, it was a temple to the god Pan. And Pan was the god of the underworld. And there was a pit there. The pit is still there. Right? That they thought that this was an entrance to the underworld. Most likely through sacrifices down this seemingly bottomless pit in some way, shape, or form. And so it's interesting, I think, that Jesus says, and this pit was called the gates of hell. Because they thought that it led to the underworld. So when Jesus stands and says there, listen. Peter, upon you I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I think two things we have to understand. He's talking about the idea of this pagan worldview. Right? He's talking about this, that Jesus is literally standing in a place called the gates of hell. Whenever he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The other thing we have to remember is that Jesus is using offensive language, not defensive language. In other words, he doesn't say that the church is on the defensive and that, that the gates of hell are pounding away. When you want to destroy something, you did, when you want to overthrow a city, you overthrow the gates first. That was the weakest point of the city. So he says the church is the one that's going to be advancing. The church is going to be on the offensive. The church is taking the fight to the gates of hell. And the, the gates of hell will not stand up against the advance of the church. And I think we have that totally backwards. I think we as the church and as Christians so many times, we step back in a defensive position and go, our goal is to shelter ourselves against the attacks from without. And that's not what Jesus called us to do. He called us to advance the kingdom. He says, and guess what? The 
gates of hell won't stand up against the power of the gospel. They can't stand up against it. You can overcome anything with the power of that. Okay. A um, couple more things, real quick. Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up uh, a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. I always think that's interesting that that's pretty much how Revelation describes Jesus, isn't it? Revelation chapter 1. Um, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, can you just imagine this? I mean, if you're one of these guys that you see Moses and Elijah, that, that's just crazy. Um, talking with him, and Peter said to Jesus, Look, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Rise and have no fear. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And they were coming down the mountain, and Jesus commanded them, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And the, then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. All right, so we have here, um, six days later, Jesus takes these guys up to a high mountain, traditionally Mount Hermon. And they see Jesus glorified. And they also see him talking with Moses and Elijah. Now, that they see a lie. Now, the first question is this. How did they know that was Moses and Elijah? Name tags? I don't know. I just always think, obviously, the Spirit, or maybe Jesus said, I don't know what it was. But it was just, I always wonder that. You know, which makes me think, all right, when we get to heaven, are we just going to instantly recognize people? I mean, obviously, they were in their glorified bodies. So that's, I just wonder. I think that's kind of something kind of interesting to think about. So they see Moses and Elijah. Uh, now the question is always, why Moses and Elijah? All right? Um, doesn't tell us. Doesn't tell us at all. Many people think it represents the law and the prophets. Um, could have been this. Um, another, I think it's Luke, talks about that says that they were talking with Jesus about his departure. Um, in other words, I think these guys, because we're about to the point where it says that Jesus turned his attention toward Jerusalem, that Jesus knows what is coming, that I think they were giving him a pep talk, encouragement, that Jesus knew that he was about to head down the road to Jerusalem and where that was going to lead. I mean, you think about it, two guys that basically come and say, stay the course, encourage him. I don't know what else they talked about. Hopefully we'll find out one day. We'll get to ask him. And of course, they, they see Elijah and they go, Oh, Elijah. And I love what Jesus says. says, Yeah, Elijah did come. It was John the Baptist. That's who, that's who he was. He came in that spirit and said, Listen, they mistreated him. And they're going to do the same thing to me. All right. The last thing we want to look at is healing and discussion, which really kind of goes through the end of chapter 17. And it goes all the way through really... Um, all the way through chapter 18. And what you see here is just Jesus doing more and more teaching. Right? So while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had a demon-possessed boy who was brought to the disciples, but the disciples couldn't heal him. And that, that happens in here. And Jesus returned and healed the boy, and he tells the disciples, Hey, listen, you guys, you need more faith to do this. You're going to have to have more faith. If you this, this sort of thing can only be done by much prayer and faith. And so then the group returns to Capernaum. And at the end of it, what you have at the end of chapter 18, is that Jesus is teaching them again. And Jesus is starting to tell them frequently, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over. And after three days, he's going to be killed. And after three days, he'll rise again. So Jesus keeps dropping this idea that there's something coming that you guys don't quite 
put it all together yet. That if you think we're going to Jerusalem to crown me as an earthly king, but the reality is that's not going to happen. And he keeps telling them this. So, all right, so that's where we end up at the end of the third year. So questions? Comments? Yes, go ahead, Nick. the gospel on the day of Pentecost. You're going to be the first one to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And I think what he's telling him there is, I'm giving you the keys. In other words, you're going to get to, you get to unlock the door for the gospel to go into the whole world. And when you preach this gospel, it's going to be radically different. Right? It's, it's the new covenant. And you're going to be preaching things that people haven't thought of before. And then when you preach that, hey, the only way to come to Jesus is to God is through Jesus, that you have to be baptized, that you have to have faith in God, all these things that you're going to do, these are going to be radically different ideas. And he says, when you preach those, though you're not making something, you those have already been decided. That when you bind, in other words, when you preach the gospel, that's that's been decided long ago. So Peter, you're not making this up. Whenever you bind something here on earth, it has already been bound in heaven. Right. And there's some complicated Greek verbs, verb tenses that go into that too. I won't bore you with all that. But the best way is that this will have already been bound in heaven. So Peter, when you preach, don't, you know, when what you are going to preach as the key to the kingdom of heaven, the gospel, it has already been decided. And I think that's the best way. Again, you don't get that understanding of it unless you understand what he's really telling him, you know, back there a little bit. So, okay. Jesus is the Son of God, as preached by these apostles. Because really what 
When you understand that, what is Jesus doing there? He's giving a preview of what's going to happen in the book of Acts. He's, he's, he's saying, listen, I want to show, I want to give you a glimpse of what I'm, of my mission, of how you're going to be fishers of men, of all these things. That, and Peter, you are going to do these important things. And so you better be, because you look at that in chapter, I mean, you, you think about that. What happens right after that in chapter 16? He tells about his death and his resurrection. But look at the end of chapter 16. We didn't even talk about this. Then Jesus told his apostles, if you come after me, you have to be, take up your cross and follow me. So as soon as Jesus says, you've got a big job ahead of you, Peter, what does he follow that up with? And it's going to be really easy. No, he follows it up with, and it's going to cost you your life. And you have to be willing every day to, to lay down. You have to lay down not just your physical life. You have to lay down your desires. You have to lay down your preference. You have to lay down control of your life. That, that's what this is going to involve. You know, it's going to involve, a, it's going to involve giving up everything up. And that's what I'm calling you to do. So... Any other questions, comments? So what we're going to see next week is that Jesus turns his eyes toward Jerusalem. That he starts that final journey um, on his way to the crucifixion. So, all right. Thanks for coming. Uh, one, 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 oh. is, is what you're teaching us and teaching anybody mm -hmm. that will listen, is this... It's a direct revelation from God. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I do not believe that. You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, how, how do you get to the point where you understand the Bible on this level? Yeah, part of it is education. Um, you know, that is. But honestly, I think what, I think the most important thing is to understand the Bible correctly. The best thing that you can do is study it for yourself. And I think that it's good. I think what we're doing here is good for how, you know, a, a teacher teaches this. But the way that you grow more in your faith is you do it by yourself and you study, rather than just rely on what one other person says. And, and it's learning, you know, yeah, it is study. It is, it's reading at the, there's, there's a lot of study that goes on behind it too. But a big part of it is, and I truly believe this, is that, is understanding the Bible is really more than anything else about knowing the right questions to ask of the text. And it's about going, okay, this is what's going on, and I see this, all right, so, so how do I start understanding what this is? Now, here's the cool thing, is that you guys know I'm, I'm going, starting a new job, I already have, a uh, new ministry, but here's one of the things I've already been working on is that we're getting ready to radically shift the life group curriculum. That's one of the things, my responsibilities. And one of those things is going to be not just to come and hear somebody teach a life group lesson or Don Sanders on video, but one of the things that we're going to be distributing and helping people understand is how do you do this for yourself through the week so that when you do come together on your life group that, that it's not just let's listen to what this guy says and then walk on but we're actually developing a whole, a whole process that we're going to give out and help people understand. This is how you, this is how you do this. This is how you do this Bible study for yourself. Because I do firmly believe. I have a couple convictions about Bible study. Number one is that Bible, the, the Bible is accessible to everybody who seeks it with a pure heart. I do believe that. That it's not hidden. It's not esoteric knowledge that only. The spiritually enlightened can attain or anything like that. But I think another misconception is yes, you can understand it, but there's there's work that goes into understanding, just like anything else. And that the more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, if if I wanted to all of a sudden study medicine, yeah, my first go around is gonna be pretty rough. On the, you know, but if I've been studying it for 30 years, then yeah, I get it. So that's one of the things that we're going to be working on. Hopefully you'll see that in the next couple of weeks, actually, probably, is just a, a new method for, for personal Bible study daily 
as you do it, and that's going to culminate in the life group lessons, and it's going to be pretty cool. So, but part of it, but part of it is, so I'll give, I'll give you a couple recommendations. One is, um, as you read, is get, get some good resources that will help connect these dots as you do. A good study Bible will help do that. Um, that, that would be one of the first places I look at. It's just a good study Bible helps you do that. And then also, um, really some other good, uh, other books that help you sort of connect those dots. Bible background commentaries and stuff like that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I just, the language, you know, different languages. There's no well, then, yeah, now, you know, that, the, the original languages is a whole other thing to pick up. And, Here's a Bible app. Yeah. There's a lot of them, yeah. Part of what is, um, what I always tell, you know, there are some things that, you know, there are some things that not everybody needs to know. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in the sense of somebody, you know, somebody needs to know this, but not everybody needs to know this. And that's just sort of, like I said, like a doctor. You know, somebody needs to know everything there is there about medicine, but I don't. And so I'm going to rely on that. Some of those things are, but... Man, if, I don't think I don't think there's anything Bible study that I would tell people. If you're interested in that, then you should stay away from it. I'd say go for it. And if you're really interested in, in learning those things, man, that's that's some cool stuff. Very very cool stuff. That's one of the other things we'll be working on is advanced Bible classes for our church, which would be pretty cool too. Yes, sir, Rick. Somebody told me, so I'll close with this. This is one of the most helpful, um, this has helped me in my, just my personal Bible study almost more than anything else. Now I don't even know where I got this from. Somebody used the illustration on me, so it's not, it's not mine. But if you can imagine, somebody have a pen I can borrow real quick? Thank you. All right, so if you can imagine that if this is, if a blank sheet of paper is the Bible, and, and everything that can possibly be known about the Bible. One of the things you have to remember is that Bible study is cumulative through your life. So in other words, that what I learned when I was 12 years old gets added to what I learned when I was 25, gets added to what I learned when I was 40, what, when I'm 50, when I'm 75, and if I'm still alive at 120, then hopefully I'm still learning more about the Bible. You know, so if, if you think about it in those terms, that every time... You know, you study something, you're adding more of what you understand about the Bible. So, if I study one little thing and I just want to learn one little tiny tidbit of that, well, that's good. I'm going to learn that. But I'm going to keep adding those things that as I go throughout my life. And that if when I study, think this past year when we studied Revelation, honestly, one of the reasons I never taught Revelation before is because I never studied it and I never had a reason to go through it in depth. But whenever you take a path through and you add more and more things, then when I take a path through a book of the Bible, I add more things to it. And the thing about Bible study, it's not how many of these, it's not how clear of a picture you get, because you'll never have the clearest picture. I would say, if we figure out God in the Bible, then he's not much of a God, because he's just as smart as I am. And if he's as smart as I am, he's not much of a God. So, but the idea is to keep, as you go, filling in more, more pieces of information and how they connect. And to realize that you'll never get the whole, whole picture. But throughout your whole life, you keep adding those things in. And, and you know, every little dot, every, every sermon, every lesson, every, every time you sit down and read the Bible for yourself. And you're going, how does this help me get a clearer under picture of clear picture of God, a clear picture of Jesus. You know, even if it's just one little dot, you still get a better better picture of it every time. And I think a lot of times we want to sit down and go, oh, I want to figure it all out tonight. You know, I mean, that's the way I am. 
You know, next time I study through Revelation, it will be like I never looked at it before because I'll go, oh man, I never saw that. I never, just the way it is. You know, and I think a lot of people get discouraged because they, they look at the blank piece of paper and go, it seems like somebody else has got a much clearer picture of this than I do. But man, that, that's not what it's about because you can always find somebody who knows more than you do. It's not comparative. It is, you learn and we're, and I think a part of it too is we're helping, we help each other learn more about it. And when somebody, one of you says something and I go, I've never thought about that. You know, never put that together. That helps me, helps get my picture clear and vice versa. So, so Bible study is the accumulation of your whole life. And every little thing paints that picture. How many more classes on Jesus? After this, I don't know what we're doing. Oh, this! I thought you meant in the future. Two more. Two more. Yes, I thought you meant like in the future. I don't know the schedule yet. I'm sorry. All right. Great questions. I'll stand around and talk more. Um, thanks for coming. Great to have you guys.